Hi, it's Susan. I'm from World Peaceful. And the theme of my talk tonight is going to be about compassion for other people. What sort of started it was I was sort of thinking of my dad. This is my father, Howard Carew. And every day whenever I look at dad's picture, I always cry. And I'm amazed at how the emotions just come straight to the surface. Now, I'm a very independent person. I've done a lot of things over the years, you know, from a peace perspective. The life I lived was not what Dad understood. And so he was always worried about my, um, my life in respect of whether I had enough money. And he saw it as an insecure life because there was no certainty Work was hard for me to get because I'm not working in traditional areas where there's a lot of security. I'm actually following my passion in life. I dreamed I was teaching peace in 1998 and it's taken me down a very different trajectory. Now, when I was contemplating my father and, and how much I love him, and how I'm amazed at how I cry every day over him. Now, when he was alive, I didn't, obviously, because he was alive. And I didn't see him that much, probably once a year. And I never cried over him while he was alive. Yet when he died, I cried every day. And the love has just been phenomenal. I've even dreamed about him. He's come to me a few times. So what that got me to thinking about was, firstly, I was thinking about how can people kill each other? I really sat and thought about it, like how can someone actually kill another person? How can a soldier be trained in such a way like this? When I think of the pain I feel of my father passing away, but imagine if my father was murdered. Imagine my dad was drowned at sea. You know, imagine he had a terrible death at the hands of someone else. That would just devastate me. It would be a nightmare to live with. So you can imagine the families and how they cope when, when their family members are killed. So this whole thing of creating heroism around the murder of people, I'd, I've never resonated with. And I'm not saying there's not heroism in war, but there's heroism in the mother that raises three children but that doesn't get the coverage because it's, it, it's a, a certain profile that we seem to market in such a way in order to justify the expenditure that goes into these areas and we call it defence. In fact, we're never defending. Um, Australia's certainly never been under direct attack apart from Japan and that was Second World War. That was up in Darwin. Other than that, you know, we've really never confronted any sort of attack where we've had to defend ourselves. So even the word defence is a misnomer. But I'm going to move from the military. I just sort of went there because I was, I just couldn't understand it. I was really, I don't actually understand it. I never have. I've never understood it because I've never wanted to hurt anyone. I really haven't. I mean, I've had my moments where you get angry, but I've never, ever wanted to hurt anyone couldn't bear it and it was funny you know I was, I was looking at some of dad's poetry tonight and he talked about living a good life and you know having a clear conscience when I read I thought yeah I'm like that you know I believe in a clear conscience too I, I just I wouldn't even want to say anything horrible to anybody I would never go silent on anyone I would never in any way seek to cause them any pain I'd be worried about them you see that's empathy and I've been born with that. So when I say these things, I'm not sort of saying everyone should be like me. I'm just saying that this is how I see and I, I'm very in touch with my humanity. So tonight I found a video and I've had it a, a, a week or so. And this is the Burnside Conversations. Julian Burnside, he's an amazing human rights lawyer. He's an incredible guy, actually. Um, he's represented trade unions and, you know, that, 
that can be also profiled as a dirty word. It's like anything that confronts power. It's not even whether they're unions or not. I've come to understand this really clearly these days. But because we're unconscious in the society we're living in, we hear all these things and we're not realising that these ones that have actually stood up to advocate for other people are the real heroes in this world. I mean, I'm just starting to learn about advocacy now. I'm doing community services. I didn't know I was doing a subject that was about actually advocating. It's really democracy that I'm learning. I've been amazed and I'm just going, that's a democracy. It's facilitating a voice in a world where people are just indifferent. And I've certainly encountered that. So I want to talk a little bit about Julian, Julian interviewed Julian Trigg as well, who's an international lawyer and a very amazing Australian. I've written to Julian Trigg before. Uh, she was in the Human Rights Commission. And I heard tonight that they they wanted to get rid of the, this is the government wanted to get rid of the Human Rights Tradition Commission, I should say. We're not at all, um, as a country, perceived favourably in respect of human rights, particularly, as I was saying in this video tonight, um, Manus Island, Christmas Island, Nehru. These are the islands um, off the Australian mainland. And I always remember when they excised the, 19, I think, 1951 convention, which is Australia signed a convention to say that it would accept refugees because refugees and this is something i'm relating to they're actually homeless <laughs> like i've been <laughs> and I, I i don't i'm not calling them refugees anymore they're homeless people now i've been homeless in my own country and it's a terrible feeling and, and you can see i'm blonde haired blue eyed i've had an education i'm not unclean or living in a shanty I'm not violent, and yet I've been, you know, discriminated against on lots of levels. So it's the label that we apply to people and say, you're not worth as much as this other person. Now, Julian, when he was travelling around, he was talking to people who have obviously had their work involved with refugees. I've certainly had involvement with them as well. I've known them directly and I know of stories and I've interviewed on radio, um, I think it was Aladdin Sicilian many years ago, he was a refugee. He actually swam through shark infested waters from New Guinea to Australia. He actually, he actually I think landed at Christmas Island, I can't quite remember if it was Christmas Island, but he certainly conveyed to me that there was some pretty awful treatment that he received. Now, the big issue really that Julian's trying to work out is the lack of compassion. And I think Julian Trigg too, she's been really astounded at the lack of compassion towards people who are suffering. And I want to add something to this conversation because I've had a lot of hardship in my own life. I've also had a lot of joy in my life too. I've been very lucky. I've been a clown and travelled the world and I've made a lot of people laugh and I've laughed a lot. And I've pretty much trekked out on my own trajectory. But I've also suffered intensely because I've confronted these mindsets that have no feeling for the other person. And of course, Julian he's not understanding it either but I actually feel I understand now why it is and it's to do with the uh, Protestant work ethic it's to do with economics basically anyone who's not generating income is considered unworthy and I've even seen with some of the welfare agencies they're even saying that they support the, the welfare recipients who they're dealing with, they're, they're very supportive of getting them off welfare. And I'm just going, wow, that's interesting. So that mindset's permeated some in the welfare sector as they seek to get million-dollar contracts with the government 
And so they mirror the narrative, which can give it validation. They don't sit in principle and say, this is actually not right. People are entitled to welfare. And, you know, I kind of, you know, I'm trained in economics and I just laugh and it's like, how can you victim blame people on welfare and push them off? Well, what are you going to push them off into? You don't have full employment. The whole economic system hasn't been able to achieve that. I mean, the whole drive with Keynesian economics was full employment. But it's never happened because there's a vested interest in having people in vulnerable situations where they're not earning much because you can pay them less money. So we're dealing with mindsets that are all about maximising their own best interest. And they really don't care about those people because they don't relate. They've never been in that. They've possibly been in generations of mindsets that believe that they're entitled and, and they're superior on some level. So there's a real disconnect in the reality on the ground and those who are making decisions at these high levels who have to have a narrative going that validates the inhumane treatment of homeless people, whether they're in a, from another country seeking refuge or whether they're in our own country seeking refuge. To me, the mindset's the same. You know, I am, I'm getting it, you know, like <laughs> it's amazing. So I want to go still on the refugee issue because this, I think there's how many the, the millions who would be fleeing persecution around the world. So we're dealing with this abuse of people. I want to go still about it because I felt inspired with this video from Julian Burnside, so I'll go quiet. First words that come up is you are me. I am the mirror of you. What you do to another, you do to the self. The, depri the, the deprivation of another is the mirror of the deprivation of yourself. So I want to go still on that again. There's a bullying component to this in that they know they can get away with it with vulnerable people. I'll give you an example. Um, I, I was a clown and I remember meeting an artist who was a clown and he worked with masks. And I remember he, he wanted to do a role play and he had a half mask, but it was a mask of a vulnerable person who was very frightened, very scared, and he set up the role play. And I played the bully and, and he played the vulnerable person. And before I knew it, I was sounding like a bully. I was able to draw from within myself that very energy of persecution, of condemnation, of taunting which probably came from childhood, you know, because we've all done it. But it came up very readily when the image was placed before me and we were role-playing it. And that's when I realised it was in everybody. So there's no them and us. I always say that in my videos because there's not. Given any circumstance, we can all do the same thing to one another. So it can be very hard for people to relate to those who are disconnected emotionally. I've actually had a lot of experience with the emotional disconnect from others and cried <laughs> when I realised that my life wasn't of any value. But because I have been born with very strong empathy, whenever I felt pain, I used to think of other people very naturally. It was very easy for me to put myself in the shoes of someone else 
And I also just had such connection with my feelings that as soon as someone's suffering, I'm aware and I'm very quickly seeking to alleviate the suffering. I almost can't bear to let someone suffer for very long. I wouldn't even let, let someone go overnight if I knew they were in any form of pain. And yet I've experienced people who have allowed me to go for years with uh, the knowledge that I was suffering. I hold no hard feeling against those who felt nothing for me. Even when I wanted to end my life, there was just no empathy whatsoever. I feel and harbour absolutely no negativity whatsoever. And I'd just like to say that negativity comes from powerlessness and that's one of the clues with the bullying issue in respect of those who are perceived as vulnerable. So the problem we're dealing with here is the perception of vulnerability. That's the issue. In a homeless capacity, I knew it was the label of homelessness. The minute I said to someone, and I just bravely went ahead and said it because I wanted to see what they would do and how they would treat me because I was curious. I say, oh, I'm homeless. Suddenly the situation shifts. I'll give you an example. As a woman, I'll never forget. <laughs> I remember because I look the way I look. Oh, people think she's working, she's married, she'd have children, she'd have a house. They had no idea that I was homeless. And I talked to people like I'm talking through the this camera now. So I, I chat with this woman outside a coffee shop and we're having a good old chat about life and rah-rah. And... I then told her I was homeless. Now, her response to that was to immediately go back and do her crossword. She actually ignored me. <laughs> and I went, oh, that's interesting psychology. She's just hung on me all these prejudices because of one word. Even though we'd spoke for half an hour, the minute homelessness came up, I was instantly rejected it wasn't me that was rejected it was the perception of the label of homelessness and what fears that masked so for her it's like oh she's desperate oh she could be on drugs oh she could be wanting money from me <laughs> and of course none of that was true i was just having a chat <laughs> i wanted nothing i never asked for anything the only times i've ever asked for stuff has been when I've been really, really seriously without money for food and I've borrowed it. I don't actually accept, well, people have given me money but um, and I've allowed them to because it enables them to get in contact with their abundance, believe it or not. I want to explain that a bit. When people give truly from the heart, what they're experiencing is the abundance within themselves that says, I've got something here to give. So we're all in relationships of giving and receiving. I typically give a lot of my time. I give compassion. Um, I communicate with people all the time and I bring a smile to their face. That's even, I don't have to be dressed as a clown. I do it all the time because I have a very natural inclination towards connection with other humans. And I love people and they know I do. They can, they can see it in my eyes. So... It's interesting living in a world like this because obviously if I was in charge, the world there would be no refugees in the world that I live in and there are no refugees in the world I live in. One of the issues that Julian Burnside brought up was how that, that he couldn't understand how people didn't see their humanity, they didn't care, because in the detention centres they were sewing up their lips because they weren't allowed to speak. These were the Afghans and, and these are all genuine refugees. Most of them, 99% of them would be genuine. I've actually clowned in a um, detention centre here in Melbourne to my amazement and it came from inspiration when I decided to do it. I had gone down to Swanson Street in Melbourne and it was actually Burke Street because I was in the Burke Street Mall. Now, I had a situation where I spoke to a woman who was a bit of an activist for, for women's issues, I think she was, and she was more into protest, whereas I'm not really. Um, I, I'm a very positive person. So I sort of came up with the idea of why not create two 
big Christmas cards, <laughs> like really big, <laughs> and I, I took them into the this Burke Street Mall, which is a mall, and I said, oh, excuse me, would you like to write a note to someone who hasn't got a home? And this is refugees, right? And we'll stick it up on the Christmas card. And I had a second card, which was to the UN, and that was about peace messages. I said, would you like to write to the UN and just whatever your wish is for peace? Because it was around Christmas. So I filled up both of these cards. And then I thought, oh, I should take one to detention centre. So I decided to do that. And I rang this particular detention centre. It was Maribyrnong here in Melbourne. Maximum security detention centre, I might add. <laughs> and I just said, look, I'm a clown. Could, could I, I, I said, can I bring my Christmas card? I've got a Christmas card to give the refugees. <laughs> I didn't say it was over six feet long. <laughs> and I said, I'm a clown, you know, could I come with it? And they said, how many clowns are you? And I said, there's three of us and we'll come and clown. And they let us come. And that's very unusual because you have to usually know a refugee before you can even get in there. And I, I have a lot of inspiration in my life and this was clearly one of those cases. It was a miracle that we got in, but we did. And I always remember going to the maximum security gates dressed as a clown and the Welsh security guy, he's, he made some comment and I sort of said something, oh, we haven't got any weapons of mass distraction, destruction. We've got weapons of mass distraction <laughs> in my bag and I had my love glasses on, put them on. Actually, I should put my hat on. I'm going to I'm gonna go get that. I bought a hat recently and I actually like it. I feel like clowning, so I'm going to get my hat. Ooh. Do you like my hat? <laughs> I thought I could do it like that. I have to get a rabbit. I have to put a rabbit in there, don't I? I have to be able to pull a rabbit out of my hat. I've got my happy T-shirt on. I should really show you that while I'm at it. See, I was wearing that today. So I'll keep that on because it's kind of the ambience of the moment when I was clowning in the detention centre and I was juggling and my juggling balls, you know, and they told us to go out the back, you know, where there was all the refugees. Big green area. They were having a bit of a Christmas thing. And, uh, yeah, I went massage them, giving them peace, <laughs> poor buggers. <laughs> and also the guards. I also interacted with the guards and the International Red Cross was there. And I remember one of the white women, this white woman, I went, oh, do you, are you a volunteer? And she goes, no, I'm, I actually overstayed my visa. I think she was from the United States. Some of them were from Fiji, the Pacific Islands, Iraq, Afghanistan, Um. Scandinavia, oh, not Scandinavia, hang on, uh, Yugoslavia, ex-Yugoslav countries, Croatia, places like that. Not many. I mean, that was very low number. Majority were Pacific and Iraq and Afghans, who, those guys be coming out of the war zones, of which our country is involved, you know, so it's a bit like karma, what you put out comes back. And I... It was, look, it was amazing, the connection with the people. I got I got all the guards and everybody to do a group hug. And I did that because I wanted the refugees to see the humanity in the guards. I was trying to build a bridge between them and for the guards to see the valuing. Now, this statement I'm making is really important about valuing people. I've sat with homeless people being having been one myself, and I still am. I'm just in emergency accommodation right now but I'm housed. And again, the way I look, I would seem middle class. And I actually did sit with a guy who some police approached and they were wondering who I was. And I noticed they, speak, they spoke to this guy with more respect. Now, he'd had a run-in with them before, same guys. There had been an altercation. And he got tense. I could see him getting tense. So I sort of, in a sense, came alongside him. Now, in the peace area, 
it can be called protective accompaniment if you're alongside vulnerable people. Now, they're only vulnerable because of the perception of who they are. If he was working in business, those labels, discriminations hanging off the word would not be there. So the treatment of vulnerable people is coming from the perception around the words that have been unconsciously accepted as somehow this person is in some way creating this problem, they are not working, they're sponging off the system. There's a lot of stuff underneath the surface of the word. So going back to the detention centre, these people have been put in a maximum security jail. They're innocent people fleeing persecution and yet they're jailed. How do we stack that up against the perception of the criminal? And again, this perception around that too, someone breaks a law. They are then deemed as a criminal. So we label them, they go to jail. And of course, we never forgive them because when they come out of jail, you have to have a police check no matter what you're doing. So people are going to find out. So they'll just keep getting shunted down a pathway of powerlessness. So I'm going back to the word of powerlessness because the negativity comes from powerlessness. And today when I was in the forest, I was actually thinking about this very very subject. And I was thinking, yeah, it's also in the, the ruling elites as well. They're powerless as well. So the poorest of the poor, the ones at the very top. Now you might say, how can they be powerless? They've got all the money, they can go and do anything. All negativity is arising out of powerlessness. So even a poor person who feels powerless becomes very negative. They look at the society with resentment because they're blaming them. The one at the top who's negative towards another is having a judgment on the basis of a label and saying this one is undeserving. Given my world of view that you should work really hard and be self-reliant, and I've heard all this before and I laugh, <laughs> yet everybody's dependent within the economic system, everyone, because you're getting a wage. Even politicians are dependent on their wages. <laughs> we take that away, they're going to survive. Probably not. When I went around Australia, I, I contemplated refugees when I was going around Australia. Australia's big. I went on my own and I was out in the desert. And I just remember thinking there's plenty of room in Australia to house people. In fact, Gillian Trigg, the Human Rights Commission, ex-Human Rights Commission lawyer, she was saying that Australia's intake of refugees is less than a 1%. And yet there's this narrative around them being generous, bringing, you know, allowing people to come. Well, we're not really. We got a huge country. And I remember thinking, oh, how many how many refugees could we house here? Heaps. Heaps. I did go to a town in uh, South Australia which had a lot of Hazara, Hazara from the from Afghanistan. They're actually the descendants of the Mongols, you know. Very interesting. So they have more Asiatic look. Genghis Khan, he invaded Afghanistan. And like most empires, they came to die in Afghanistan. <laughs> and they would all be perplexed by that. It's like, how can how can we lose in Afghanistan, poorest country in the world, and we've got all the technology? Well, it's because these people have unity amongst them. That's the power. And there's no powerlessness when you feel love for your people and your community. And, of course, that can be perceived as a threat. It's all perceptions we're dealing with here. It's not reality. Because the, when you come into reality, you actually have the experience yourself. And until you're homeless, you're not going to know. And it's just living without a home. That's it. And yet opportunities all dry up because the label is there. I could say I'm the CEO of Happiness Australia. You know, I like my hat. I am the CEO. And then everyone goes, oh, you're a fun person. We really like you. And you become popular because <laughs> I use a label. And yet has anybody actually sat down and really got to know me? No. 
So I'm going to go still again on this issue because we're moving into an interesting paradigm right now where the world economy has been collapsed. Even though things are coming back to some sort of activity, I, I believe it's going to happen more. <laughs> Could be wrong, but I don't think I am. <laughs> because of the mindset that Julian is exploring, a disconnected mindset that can't relate to the suffering of innocent people, really, who are seeking some form of refuge, whether they're homeless in, in country or whether they're going between countries, doesn't really matter. They have nothing. And I think it harks back to a deep, deep fear within every human being of having nothing. So that other becomes, you know, I was saying the mask and the mirror, that other that is penniless, that is vulnerable, that's desperate in their mind. It's perceptions, remember? Perceptions. Oh, they could be desperate too, but how that desperation manifests could be different for different personality types. Some might be hungry. where well, you're going to get desperate and want food. So that's a biological urge. So what I'm saying is there's a very, very deep, possibly unconscious, I'd say it's likely, unconscious fear of a desperation and that one having nothing. So something within us feels deeply insecure at the thought of being penniless. It may well be in our genes too, in that we've had the experience in our lineage, all of us, even the ones at the top, have come from poverty. And we all share as human beings a fear of that poverty. And so like any sort of consciousness um, species, that vulnerable one gets attacked. Now, hard-hearted ones could say, oh, well, they should die off if they're disconnected, which some of them are, and they would be saying that. Get rid of the weak stock. <laughs> we want to keep our gene pool, you know, robust because look at us, we've survived. And look at us, we just keep surviving well. There are reasons why that happened and that's to do with strategy and keeping the money in the family. <laughs> that doesn't necessarily mean superiority, it just means that, that you believe that your security and your power is connected to the money. Is that true? So there's a lot of perceptions driving the way we treat one another when we don't care about our impact on other human beings, whether that be in a, in a war setting where we leave people to die. I mean, First, Second World War in the trenches, you know, would have been horrendous. People would have been absolutely in huge agony. And these were not your, your landed gentry that were in the trenches. The landed gentry would have been the ones who were organising the planning of the wars. No, it was the cannon fodder. <laughs> that was the ones who were considered to be uneducated, commoners, not of, not of value. So this idea of not of value, it's deeply embedded on the basis of money. And it's come down from generations. So, you know, my feeling is always that I don't really blame anyone. I think it's understandable when you realise that they don't know that they don't know, that these ideas have been passed on from father to son. The war stories have been passed on from father to son, not from mother to daughter, definitely from father to son because we don't relate to it. Women are nurturers. We, we don't relate to going and shooting each other. Although some hard-hearted ones might think it's a good idea but. It's a zero-sum game and it's like, well, how can you how can you actually make the decision that you have the right to take someone's life? But then highest perspective kicks in for me and I realise that they transition across, they live on. So we're living in a very dynamic universe here. There is no death in reality because we live on. And some people might say that's not true. 
I can assure you it is. I've seen apparitions myself. My father did come to me in my dream, and I believe it was a visitation. I do. Because in the dream we talked, and I actually said to him, I said, where are you? And he went, nowhere. And I didn't take that as in between worlds. I took it as he's not located in any specific place, locale. Because when they tra when you tra we all transition from physical into spirit, we actually become energy. And we take some of our learnings from this life with us. And in my dream, I asked Dad, I said, are you happy? And he didn't speak it, but he he looked at me and the it could have been telepathic, I don't know, but the impression I got was when I looked at him, he was, of course, of course I'm happy. It's like, how can you not think I'm not happy? And in the dream, because this is something I've thought, you know, I wish I could, you know, tap my dad's arm or hug him. You know, it's funny you want to touch your family. I'm just looking at his picture. And in the dream, I actually got to hug him and I felt it. Now, the reason I think it was a visit was because I, can, I felt consciousness come to me in the dream, awakening me in the dream where I was going, take in every moment. You're having a moment with your dad. And I looked really closely at my dad's face and his blue eyes and I really felt it was a special moment I was given. So sometimes I say, oh, I'll never see you again. And then I'm thinking, yeah, you have seen him already. So that brings me peace. Now, the reason I bring in this is we're all playing with perceptions here on the planet. This is none of it's true. None of it. None of it. If you go across, pass over, you transition across, well, what are you joining? You're joining the bigger consciousness, which some would call higher intelligence. Some might call it God. Some might call it ecosystem. Some might call it, you know, um, energy. I always see E equals MC squared, Einstein. And if that's our true form, is spirit, well, then here on the planet, we've got some lessons here. We're, we're having the experience of separation from each other where I get to experience my pain myself, but you don't. I get to go through life in lots of different ways. Like I've been an analyst, I've been a secretary, you know, I've worked in retail, I worked in hundreds of companies, you know, I've worked in the media, I've been on radio, I've been an author, poet, you know. So my own labelling, if you like, or experience has gone through so many manifestations. But what I've seen really clearly is how you are perceived, and people do know this, as they seek to present themselves to the world that they're successful, they have a nice car that they're in hock to, <laughs> nice wife, or husband, I'm success, you know, and then you're going to attract it to you on the basis of the perception. So going back to Julian, Julian Burnside, he's trying to understand the dehumanization of people he sees like himself. And the reason he sees it is because he identifies with everyone. You know, he was representing union, so he, he certainly saw himself in others would be a more clear way of putting this. I've been a clan and I've clowned all over the world and in all countries, you know, 20 countries, a lot. I've danced with people in Nepal, you know, I've been on buses and, you know, dust. I dust people, I have a duster. <laughs> I've been in the United States in Chicago and at a jazz festival teaching someone to juggle. I've been with bonded labourers. These are people who were actually enslaved and we met them as a bunch of clowns. We met them having... Uh, a celebration and oh, I'm just getting rid of this thing we met them at a celebration in India and these guys had worked for 20 40 years as slaves they were bonded laborers 
And what that means is that they were not paid, they were enslaved. Now, some of their fingers were worn to the bone. We got them all laughing and I had some women with me who'd been slaves and I was teaching them how to juggle and they were laughing. And at the end, the guy who sort of organised our trip, he was talking with the leader of their group and we had a translator and he said it was the first time in his life he'd laughed. He'd felt like a child, first time, because he didn't have a childhood. He was enslaved as a child. Now, obviously, some labels would have applied there in order that, that he be seen, probably his caste, I would say, which was what the label was. You know, if you're a high caste Brahmin, you're meant to be living high the high life because you are a Brahmin. If you're a Dalit at the very bottom, an untouchable, you should be cleaning the toilets. You're not worth it. In fact, in their thoughts, I don't know the caste system super well, but let's just say that they believe that they have to live this life because of something they've done in a past life. That's actually not true. Um, every soul gets to choose when they come to the earth. There's an agreement. So we're here to learn from one another. And the teacher may come in the shape of a refugee. The teacher may come in the shape of a homeless person begging on the street. The teacher could be in the shape of a politician, could be a businessman who's engaging in some sort of activity that evokes a very strong response. Now, the reason I say things like mirrors and masks is that when I look at that person, I'm looking through my own filters, my beliefs, my education, my background, any sort of prejudices that I've been taught as part of my cultural story may well get projected onto that homeless person, let's say. Let's say I, I, I was never homeless. Let's say I lived... Uh, let's say I was an economist because I was trained in economics and that's where I could have gone. There were lots of jobs in Canberra. I could have been in Canberra as an economist. I, I grew up in Canberra. <laughs> that's the capital here. So let's say I was working in Treasury. I was an economist. I was making 120000 a year. I was rubbing shoulders with politicians and powerful people, let's say. And then I see a homeless person. Now, in order for me not to connect with them emotionally, I would have to project a perception onto them which enables me to not feel anything because then I'd have to do something. That's why we judge. It's a form of defence mechanism. It's a mechanism so that I don't have to get involved because this is unknown territory for me. And... I don't want to connect. So I might say, oh, well, it's, they're always going to be homeless people. Oh, well, they don't help themselves. You know, look at this one, begging, go and get a job. Anyone can get a job. I've got a job. If I can get a job, you can get a job. Well, is that true? You know, I had an economics degree. This one on the street doesn't. I might look acceptable to the society this one may not. This one's dirty, smelling, maybe on drugs. So in order for me to keep walking, I have to somehow project onto them that they are deserving of their state of worthlessness. Now, if I decide to change my mind and go, you know what, I'm going to sit with, and this, I've done this myself, I'm going to sit with them. I'm going to find out their name. I'm going to get a name because when I get a name, I've got a human here. If I call them a homeless person, it's perception. I don't have to connect. Keep walking. If I sit with them on the street, I'm saying I'm equal to you. And that's what I do. Saying, what's your name, John? Hi, John. Yeah. I said, oh, I've been homeless. Yeah, I know, I know what it's like. Or I am homeless. You know, when I was really connecting with them, it was when I was. And, and I still am technically. 
even though I've got a little bit of income now and I do have a roof, roof over my head, I don't have a permanent home, I don't own anything. So when that happens, I then hear their story. Now, to my amazement, some of the homeless I've met didn't respect the people walking past. They actually saw them as less. And I, I would never in a million years have thought they were thinking of the ones walking past as less, some of them, not all of them, and not respecting them because those people didn't care. So there was no respect. They saw them as no res having no respect. And what that really is saying is that when you don't connect with people, you don't value them. So it goes both ways. So some homeless didn't value the people walking past. Those walking past didn't value the homeless when they chose not to connect. But when you connect, you can't avoid meeting the personality, finding out they've got a family, that they've had a life history prior to this moment. Some of them have been married. Some of them had high-powered jobs. There was a professor, I think, sleeping in Hyde Park in Sydney. He just had enough and he went out there. Out there. I knew, I knew a guy, I met a guy who um, his mother died and he went out bush and he, he was heartbroken and he was homeless for quite a long time. I met a young girl who was with a boyfriend. They're both homeless. Her mother died. Her mother was her best friend. She was heartbroken. I met a guy who had lung condition. He had poor health. So he was begging for food and, you know, money because he was unable to look after himself. Another woman was waiting for a transplant, liver transplant, I think it was. She, yeah, it was liver. She said that when she went to the hospital overnight, they, they knew she was homeless and they, this is common, I found out from one of my friends who's a, a nurse, they actually let them go back out on the street. And that to me is the, the mirror of our society. It's mirroring this total lack of regard for the consequence to that person. We disconnect. Oh, well, it's not my job. They'll just have to, we won't worry about it. I don't want to think about it. I'm busy. It's much harder to actually... Well, there's great benefit if you do to actually go, you know what, I've got a spare room. <laughs> Everyone goes, oh, that's, that shoots fear into my little heart. <laughs> what if they don't go? You might be in danger, and this is what I usually say, of meeting a friend. The gratitude they'll feel. And I know even in my case, I'm here in a temporary place and I've been told I can stay another month. I'm very, very grateful. But you know what, if they said to me, we really need you to go because this is a temporary shelter for homeless, I would say it's meant to be. And I would say thank you so much for allowing me to stay. You really helped me. And I would trust in a higher power and off I go. Not meant to be here, meant to, be, meant to go. And that's how I live my life. That's how I can live in homelessness and poverty because I see the life rhythm. I'm not afraid and I... I trust. Nobody owes me. So for those who, who, who use words like entitlement, oh, they think they're entitled because they're getting the pittance of the Centrelink. <laughs> they're not entitled. They're not thinking they're entitled. They are entitled in actual fact under the Constitution. They definitely are. Because the whole point of the welfare state was to deal with the externalities that came from economics because economics could never promise full employment. And it's a sign of a civilised society to ensure those who fall through the cracks, and those cracks are there because the mechanisms cannot create full employment and they don't want them to. Because you get cheap labour when you've got desperate people. If everybody's got a job, it's going to be hard to attract the labour that you want. So there is definitely an interest in having the haves and the have-nots, it, it serves a purpose. But that's the story most people won't tell you because they don't know. So it's structurally created. But people believe that they're of no value and other people treat them like they're of no value, which is why we have refugees in the world 
who are not valued because they're, they're considered economically unviable because the whole mindset has been indoctrinated with an ideology that says unless you make money, you're worth nothing. Yet I know in my life experience, having been a clown and travelled and worked with Patch Adams, the clown doctor, who Robin Williams played in the movie. And I think Patch, is, I hope he's still going. I think he is. He's amazing. I watched him when he was engaging with a little girl in Moscow. And just the gentle interaction between the two and, you know, he had, um, I'll, I'll, just, I'll just get these because he had, had these. See the earplugs? He was going to the little girl. And she was going, her face was like, and he's going, and she's like, <laughs> you know, you can see she was fascinated. <laughs> she was deaf and dumb, this child. I took some footage of that to see how Patch was working with them. And see, Patch, um, he had deep compassion, and he still does. He's actually teaching compassion. Uh, he's got an eco village over in Virginia in the U.S., and he realises that we need to teach compassion because the people are losing it, you know, this whole disconnection. And I, I've often talked about the, the IT as a disconnect, and I see it as that. And I've worked in, you know, for years I worked. From 17 I was on computers. I was the first generation when they brought the laptop. So I remember it really well. And back then it was okay because we weren't on them a lot. But over time I was I ended up getting more and more on computers. And it does, it you get sucked into it and you, you know, your life just disappears. They're also uncomfortable. You know, I got bad back because I was typing all the time. So structurally, uh, ergonomically, it was problematic. So the key thing here that I'm really sharing before I finish. is the connectedness to our humanity. I'm going to go still and then I'm going to finish is what I feel. So let me just go still. I feel like laughing because I've got my hat on. <laughs> I see the clown. <laughs> it's not far from the surface. So I miss it. <laughs> I miss my clown. Anyway, shut up and be still. <laughs> Our happiness comes from our connectivity with each other. We're meant to connect. Intimacy, intimacy is intimacy. When we open the heart, in fact, the order of it is when you open the mind, the heart opens. When the heart opens, you can't not connect. It's not possible because the heart is the portal to interconnectivity on the planet which gives us a sense of community, which is common unity. This is where we feel empowered. When we're all separated, we have fear is generated at us. You can't do this, you can't do that, you're a nothing, you're a, you know, keep working, keep working, keep busy. We feel disempowered because we don't feel we have the power to affect change. Now, I could still say today, oh, I'm not being able to affect the changes that I'd like to see, but I'm self-determining and I do feel empowered. Even in a homeless capacity, I always feel empowered because I love who I am. So I don't need people to validate me and say, I love you. I don't need it. I love me. And what I mean by that is I love myself because I've taken those choices and I've really stood with me. So earlier on, I talked about protective accompaniment coming alongside people in advocacy. Well, when you're by yourself, you become your own best friend and you become your own advocate. It doesn't necessarily mean that those people are all going to help you. They're not. I've, I've actually found the opposite, total indifference and no regard for my well-being. But I didn't, I have taken it to heart 
In some cases, in other cases, I haven't. But gee, the stigma weighs heavily on you, particularly when you know people are looking at you in this way. But I've kind of decided to bravely move through this experience in order to understand it because I have a deep love of the people. Not unlike Patch Adams, I have a very similar feeling. I have a great love of the people because I can see the greatness in them, you see. When I've clowned on the streets, and I've clowned in many places, when you're looking at life through the prism of love and you've got no story going on in your head, so you're not thinking, you're just connecting with one after the other. It's incredible. In fact, before I finish, I want to just say one story which left a profound impact on me. And it was in Valore in Tamil Nadu in India. And I was with 15 clowns from Australia, most of them Australian, silly clowns. So we came <laughs> and dressed up with puppets, juggling, twirly wands, bubbles, balloons, <laughs> you name it, noisy bloody horns. <laughs> and we got into these tuk-tuks and we headed down the main street. And I had one of these toucan birds, you know, ear, ear, ear. Out the wind, I had it out the window of the of the if you can imagine of the tuk tuk. I was going oh, don't, don't, don't. <laughs> and sometimes you, you, your little toucan might bite someone. <laughs> you do gently, of course, <laughs> and people just laugh. Or you put it on their shoulder, and they just go <laughs> get a shock. So we were doing that, and I just remember faces were bland, and then suddenly they went. And you could sit and go, oh, my God, what's that? And they were smiling at each other. And it, for me, it was like flowers opening on that trip all the way. I remember very clearly, I'm going, oh, my God, enlightenment, 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 enlightenment was what I saw. And I realised the enlightenment was the joy that they felt. They had a moment of sanity amongst insanity. <laughs> Excuse me. I just had an idea before I finish. I'm going to do a prayer for the people of the world. Let's turn that off. Let's turn this on. Do you see the joy in my face? That's connecting. I cannot express to you what it feels like to be in love with everyone. When I'm a clown, and even when I'm not actually, to be honest, I have this extraordinary feeling of love within me. I love everyone and I really mean it. And I know people don't think I'm telling the truth, but I am. It's like when I see you, you know, when you see people, you fall in love with them, when you really see them. And that means I'm, when I see you, you say you're homeless, I'm not seeing homeless. I'm seeing you as a human being sitting on the ground. But I could be sitting on the ground in India it doesn't really matter. I could be sitting in a park. We're just sitting on the ground. But I see your humanity. So the joy that I experience, and this is where the real happiness comes from, is when we connect. And that's why, you know, when I've talked about Silicon Valley and all of that, please don't take offence for those who are there. I love you too, and I do, but I just feel you don't know what I experienced. Because I really have experienced the true joy. And there's nothing like it. No algorithm can, can match this. No AI can match this. Because it's the divine spark within that you're experiencing. How do I translate that? It's who you really are that you actually get in contact with. There's no emptiness when you're in touch with who you are. And when you're in touch with who you are, the real part of you, this is the moments you have when you're real, when you're real, you know, you're not putting on a facade, you're not trying to be something you're not. And you're doing the things that you absolutely love, absolutely love, and you cannot stop smiling. That's when you're in alignment with your purpose on earth. And it really is that. But we all take on roles and we, we unconsciously 
go into our jobs, we've got to get money because we're insecure and we've created scarcity. The, the universe is abundant. The lie that we've all told each other for generations, and I'm not blaming anyone here and now, but we're all part of the same lie because we keep repeating it. But that lie is that there's not enough. So the people who are homeless on the street are the far extreme of that because of the lack of wealth in the people walking past. Because if you are generous and you're in love, you're going to give to everybody. But if you're living in a poverty mentality and you're fearful of everyone because you've watched a lot of TV and violence and you believe the world's an unsafe place, you believe the lies, then you're going to become impoverished. So the person who's really in poverty is not the one sitting on the street, it's the one walking past who's got a thought going through their mind saying, don't have time for that, I'm busy, ignore them, I don't even see them anymore, I'm plugged in, I'm listening to music because I want to feel good. But what you're not understanding is that you don't need the music to feel good, you don't need to watch the video to feel good, you just have to get in touch with who you are and the goodness is there naturally. You don't need drugs. To feel what I feel, I don't need any drugs. I don't drink alcohol. don't need it because I'm happy. I'm really, really happy. I get this intense feeling of satisfaction. And I, I would be the one that you would say has nothing, but I've got everything that I need. I don't need all the things because I'm in touch with who I really am. And that's why there would be no refugees because we won't be engaging in warfare, which is profiting the few who are believing that their assets and their wealth is their happiness. It's not. It's truly not. The greatest thing you can ever do is step out of your condominium, get out of the building, go and sit on the street with someone who you've never met. And then let life guide you as to what to say. You will be guided. Now, the more you do this, you're going to start getting fascinated because you're not in control anymore. And there's not that feeling of out of control. There's a feeling of flow. When you're a clown, like I've been, <laughs> you go in the flow. There's no thought. So I'll go up and hug someone, shake their hand, muck around with the kids, roll on the ground, I might climb a tree, you know. Can do it. I'm in freedom, complete freedom. There's no thoughts going on in my head, so that's how you know. It's the thoughts, the beliefs, the perceptions that frame our world and make us either cold-hearted or open-hearted. So to answer Julian's question, the reason why we allow people into detention centres and we treat them like criminals is because we've done it to ourselves. Where have we been a refugee? Where is it that we don't belong? Where is it where we've been rejected? Where is it that we're in poverty? Because the world is a mirror. Make no mistake. Everything that turns up in your life is at your calling because of the thoughts you've put out there into the world. There is no wealth, there is no poverty. There's only these experiences of consuming things or not. The true happiness has absolutely no relationship to what you own or what you earn. It only manifests when you're in alignment with your true self. And that's really the message of this video is to get in touch with who you really are and fall in love. You don't need someone to fall in love with. I'm actually, I've been in love for many years and it's alignment with living my true nature. Now, if another person comes in, that's great. I've got plenty to share here because I'm already in love and I don't need them to love me. I, that part's sorted. I love me. And then when I look through my eyes because I'm in love, how can I not love them? It's, see, I've got tears coming to my eyes. How can I not love them? Of 
course it's not possible for me to not love them. That's your peace on earth. So I brought this candle for a, for a reason. Be a light. So we're in the darkness. Be a light until that darkness. And curse it not, I believe they say. <laughs> Just be a light to those who are in the dark. They know not what they do because if they did, they wouldn't do it. They're innocent in their darkness. And I send them enormous love because I know they suffer. Whenever we close the heart to other human beings, we're suffering. So who are the ones in poverty? They're the ones that have closed their beautiful heart. When you open it, the artist comes out. The talent emerges. The innovation, you call it innovation, it's actually creativity. It's all there because that's part of the human condition. When I clowned around the world, I was accessing the creative in me. And because my heart was open, I had no fear. So people who hold guns are in great fear because they, they've got the gun to protect themselves. They feel vulnerable. When you're fearless, when you look into every face and every face looks beautiful to you, there's nothing to fear at all. That's the beginning of peace on earth, believe me, it really is. There's nothing to fear but fear itself. Fear is false evidence appearing real. Your happy destiny is actually unavoidable. Ultimately, it's unavoidable. When you pass over, you'll know the happiest moment of your life is your death in actual fact <laughs> because you become released like the butterfly. We live on, folks. So how we live in this life will determine what you think about in your life, how you think your life, what you think it's about, what it's for will determine the type of life you choose. I know that I live on. I've seen apparitions. I know they're real. I know that our true nature is love because I've experienced it so many times and I was truly happy. So I just wanted to share that with you and that came out of the inspiration of me crying over my dad because I love him so much and I miss him. And realising how could anyone hurt anybody. And, you know, those were the same words I said when I was very young. I could never understand how anyone could hurt anyone. And I still find it hard to understand, but I have plenty of room for compassion for those who do because I realise they're in pain. And that's how we unify our world is by caring about those who may not care for us. Just care about them. There is an innocence in that ignorance and when you're in the dark, you can't, you know, you're looking for the light but you can't see it and you think everything is outside of yourself but it's not, it's inside. So I'll leave you with that, with great love. I hope you got something from it. As usual, I never know where the videos are going to go but they always go where they're meant to and that's how I know I'm in the flow. So with that, I'm sending you love and peace and enlightenment. Take care. Bye.